Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club. Uh, my name is uh, James Sims. I'm the president of the club. Uh, we just recently had an election. And as you know, this year is the SCCJ's uh, 70th anniversary. And uh, as a part of our speaker program, we are trying to get uh, representatives of Japanese government, society, and obviously business uh, to come uh, talk about the current state and the future of Japan. Um, and so today, um, we have uh, the uh, representative, the chief representative, the chairman of the Japan Association of uh, Corporate Executives, uh, Mr. Yoshimitsu uh, Kobayashi. And today, uh, he will be uh, doing a brief overview of the Japanese economy, its outlook, and what Japan needs to do to move the com country forward, um, including uh, issues such as sustainability, uh, energy policy, uh, free trade, uh, labor regulations, uh, as well as uh, environmental issues as we come into uh, the talks that will be coming up in Paris at the end of the year on uh, climate change. And we were talking in the anteroom earlier. Um, he, his background is in, um, I think it's radiation physics. And so he's, we were talking about uh, the various research projects that the, his company, um, Mitsubishi Chemical Holdings, is doing in terms of uh, trying to reduce uh, the impact on the environment from uh, economic activities. But, so anyway, without any uh, further ado, um, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, guest today, uh, Mr. Yoshimitsu Kobayashi, the chairman of the uh, Japan, Japan Association of uh, Corporate uh, Executives. And before I forget, uh, and today um, is our interpreter, uh, Ms. Takamatsu. Anyway, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction by uh, uh, Simsan. Uh, also, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you uh, in Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. As of April 29th, uh, I was assigned as the chairman of uh, Kedai Doyukai, and just uh, two months has passed. I would like to today to talk about what I'm going to uh, do together with my members of uh, Kedai Doyukai about our business management and also the proposal for the uh, government policy. Uh, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, uh, here you can read that uh, what I'm talking about is the, uh, the items about the mainly sustainability of the society and also how to handle the uh, corporate management and also a, a after, uh, before the question and answer, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, following items. One is the uh, latest Japanese economy, our opinion on uh, fiscal consolidation plan of the government, uh, which comes uh, uh, shorter, yeah, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And also free trade agreement, labor policy, energy policy of Japan and environment uh, measures. Let me first give you uh, some explanation about the terminology, Japan version 2.0. Actually, Japan version 2.0 is not a buzzword created by the Japanese media. I myself uh, created this term about two months ago. Uh, from 1945 to 90, uh, 2015, after the Second World War II, Japan enjoyed a huge economic growth. Also, some people say that latest uh, last two decades has lost 20 years. And let us call these 70 years as Japan 1.0 or version 1.0, whatever. Uh, I propose that we are now moving toward a new era from 2020, which I call Japan version 2.0. The year of 2020 marks an extremely critical juncture for Japan. We must ensure the success of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Moreover, Japan has pledged to the international community that it will achieve a primary surplus by fiscal 2020. 
At the same time, Japan faces a number of problems that require long-term solutions. We must tackle those issues so that we can make sure to move toward sustainable society. Also, as mentioned in the second machine age, or Industry 4.0, we are now coming to the age of cyber physical space, which is composed of both real economy and cyber economy. Uh, big data, AI, 3D printing, etc. In this respect, the coming five years from 2015 to 2020 will be a critical time for us to succeed the transition from Japan version 1.0 to 2.0. Now, I would like to share the urgency of this truth. No bright future without revolutionary transformation. Needless to say, we are facing a very broad range of issues. We cannot avoid looking away from inconvenient truths and problems. Particularly, I would like to share out our understanding on the following three points. Firstly, let us remember that Japan has accumulated more than 1,000 trillion yen in public debt and now faces the potential risk of fiscal collapse. Japan has made an international pledge to achieve a primary surplus by fiscal 2020. But this is merely a milestone on the way to fiscal reconstruction. The path to debt reduction must be firmly established. Number two, Japan is experiencing declining birth rate and uh, aging of society. Two problems that are com common to mature societies throughout the world. The total fertility rate in many developed countries have dipped far below two children per woman. My third point is the global agenda. It covers economic disparity and poverty, ethnic and religious conflict, shortages of food and water, the exhaustion of energy and other resources, and also climate change on a global scale. Also, I believe it is important to envision future societies from the perspectives of these global ties of change. These are globalization, IT revolution, and socializations. As I mentioned in the beginning, 2020 marks an extremely critical juncture for Japan. We must ensure the success of the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Moreover, Japan has praised to the international community that it will achieve a primary surplus by fiscal 2020. At the same time, Japan requires solutions for pollution uh, population decline, regional revitalization, uh, sustainability of social security systems, energy and the environment. We cannot allow ourselves to fall behind the global tide with th these cutting edge uh, development. By 2020, we must achieve visible and tangible result to enter the era of Japan version 2.0. It is particularly important to realize that Japan today is standing on the edge of a cliff, not a merely turning point. In developed economies as Japan, US, Europe, etc., GDP growth rate has gradually declined as society matured. Combined with the effects of the uh, rapid growth of emerging countries, the shape of these developed economy in global GDP is receding. GDP is calculated based on factors that can be measured in monetary and economic terms. Thus it provides an appropriate metric of the satisfaction and happiness that people derive from meeting their material needs. But I feel there are limits to the usefulness and the effectiveness of GDP as a metric concerning people's well-being. We, Kedai Do Yukai, 
are going to discuss on the future society, including these kinds of concepts. Although the most focal points to discuss are, of course, productivity and effectiveness of the economy or uh, business itself. Next one is the drawing of, uh, uh, of the uh, cyberspace age. A little bit, uh, it's a very fundamental mathematics I used uh, uh, in the high school we learned. Uh, let me consider Japan version 2.0 uh, from another viewpoint or another angle. I think we are now witnessing the dawning of the uh, cyberspace age. In the age of real things, value was measured in progressively smaller unit of weight and traced the shift to lighter and more compact products, from tons to kilogram to grams to milligram and finally to micrograms, like medicine or a pharmaceutical product. We can readily see that in the uh, cyberspace age, information with no weight will be the source of value. That is to say, uh, atom to bit, or bit to atom. These kind of combination will be very critical. Uh, three months ago, um, one idea come to me. I refer to this as a Z equal A plus BI, where A stand for atom and B for bit and I stand for internet. I stand for internet or imaginary parts. And at the same time, uh, it means imaginary parts or number. I believe this very elegantly described the world beyond 2020. Uh, call to mind conjugate complex number that you studied in school, as I already said, that multiplying two conjugate complex numbers a plus bi and a minus bi yields z times that z equal a plus bi times a minus bi. This in turn is equal to a square minus b square times i a square equals a squared plus b squared. A object can be measured in terms of size and weight. But what this means is that uh, virtual space with no weight and services can also be counted in terms of uh, size. This is also a little bit complicated three-dimensional drawing. Uh, now uh, let me explain my philosophy on the corporate management of uh, three or four dimensional accesses. Since 2010, I started to install this concept to Mitsubishi Chemical Holding, and now I could say around 70% become successful, settled inside the employee's mind. Firstly, I will explain very briefly what is the kaiteki value, or from where the corporate value can be defined. As here depicted, management of economics management of technology, and management of sustainability. These are very independently controlled and monitored. As you look at the x-axis, this, is, this uh, just represents the performance of uh, uh, economy or management, uh, especially return on equity. That kind of capital efficiency is always uh, very important parameters, but it's always uh, measured monthly or quarterly. And the y-axis, it represents the uh, management of technology or innovation uh, induction. Uh, that takes uh, more than decades. And the z-axis, this represents uh, a management of sustainability, which include a uh, reduction of carbon dioxide or CSR type of uh, performances of the, of the company. So if we uh, 
draw the uh, vector, which come from uh, three-dimensional uh, parameters, this blue vector, this one means just a uh, corporate value. Not usually in the market, only ROE or this uh, capital efficiency is always a, uh, cited as uh, only one parameters to pursue the uh, performance of each company, but I, I definitely think that uh, for the sustainability of the company, uh, we have to discuss these three-dimensional uh, value of the corporate, including performance of economical uh, systems and also production of the new product to the society and also, we have to take uh, care of the uh, society itself. And also, we have to think about the, uh, the concept uh, of time. Uh, because uh, we are now living in the 21st, beginning of the 21st century. What the society requires to the corporate, that kind of thing is also very important. Uh, and also, it's very interesting to know that uh, this way of corporate management of just uh, corresponding to International Integrated Recording Council principle, or ISO 26000, and also ESG methodology. Uh, as for one of the corporate governance, Keidai Doyuka already raised a proposal for ROE, return on equity. Uh, also, to our recommendation, uh, sorry, uh, according to our recommendation, companies should achieve double digit return on equity, ROE. Also, uh, last year, uh, to tell the truth, the uh, performance of uh, Mitsubishi Chemical is around uh, 6.4 ROE. Uh, there are no question ROE stand uh, as one of the critically important indicator in corporate management. At the same time, it is necessary to, to take into account such factors as the industry specific characteristics of each industry, management policies and capability to communicate with stakeholders. For, for, for instance, Amazon company is operating in the uh, red, and the, its ROE is negative. However, the company is highly valued in the stock market. I presume that many people who are working in bookstores has lost their jobs due to Amazon. But Amazon has emerged as a company capable of meeting the needs of growing number of consumers and products and provide a distribution infrastructure that is now indispensable to society. Innovative product introduced by Apple, such as iPhone and iPad, has brought about social transformation on a scale that would have been impossible to predict 10 years ago. Another issue I wish to present is that we need to break mindset of corporate executives. It is quite possible that the process of breaking through rigid regulations or uh, accelerating the pace of innovation will work to the disadvantages of our own companies or even to the elimination of certain businesses. In such instances, the possibility of corporate executives and thales becoming part of the forces of resistance cannot be denied. However, top management must be prepared to make bold decisions and to act swiftly on cutting edge development and the ties of global change. Facing an uncertain future, corporate executives frequently find themselves in turmoil and struggling with conflicting forces. But the point is that uh, we must not allow ourselves to become captives of the constructive rigidity that exists in our own mindset. 
Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, major topics for Japan economy. Some, uh, okay, since the uh, Abenomics started in the end of 2012, major improvement have been being made and we are overcoming some of what we call the six tribulations or the seven tribulations. That means uh, we have uh, six or seven handicaps when compared to the other countries. But by the, by the means of, or by the help of uh, monetary easing, this is a first row, and uh, also second row fiscal stimulation. Uh, especially this depreciation of Japanese yen contributed a lot to companies' performance as we generate profit from overseas. A view of government and other statistics indicates that the Japanese economy remains on track for a moderate recovery. What is the outlook for the Japanese economy? I expect the horizon to remain bright. We conduct quarterly surveys in Doyukai. In the latest survey this month, out of 589 members from Kedai Doyukai, 43.8% said the real GDP growth for 2015 would be between 1.5% percent and less than 2.0 percent. And then 24.6 percent forecasted somewhere between 1.0 percent and uh, less than 1.5 percent. We also asked to identify area of concern for Japanese economy. 53.3 percent deprived with the future of the world economy centered on Europe and the United States. In second place, 52.1% was a declining consumption due to lack of progress in addressing the problem of declining population. As you are aware of today, Greek EU issue will be the very strong concern for the world economy. Then come to the uh, fiscal construction, uh, consolidation. Uh, on the subject of fiscal consolidation, uh, uh, cons consolidation, as I mentioned, Japan has made an international pledge to achieve a primary surplus by fiscal 2020. To maintain the confidence of the markets, it is absolutely essential to meet this goal. On top of that, I believe it is justified to set indicators of progress in reducing the G government debt to GDP ratio and set to asset to GDP ratio. Uh, fiscal year 2018 marks the midway point in the goal for achieving a primary surplus. Shortly, the government will announce the plan, specific goal negotiated with LDP, whether or not to restrain increase of social security expenditures down to 1.5 trillion yen for three years. The Japanese government plan looks uh, very optimistic for the future revenues from economic growth, assuming that the 3% uh, nominal and 2% uh, real GDP increase. Also, by 2025, all baby boomers will be above the age of 75. This will further increase spending on health and long-term care afterwards. I consider these to be major risk factors. Uh, in the area of trade policy, above, above all, I am so much pleased to witness uh, remarkable progress in the United States Congress which had uh, great momentum to the TPP negotiations, now facing the final stage. I also hope that the United States and Japan work closely to clear all the remaining bilateral issues and uh, ministerial meeting of the 12 participating countries to be held in a timely manner. 
and the Kedai Do Yukai will appreciate successful negotiations. Also, regarding the Japan EU EPA, export and import between the two sides are roughly equal at around 7 trillion yen. On the other hand, tariff payment on Japanese export to the EU comes to about 240 billion yen, which is nearly twice the amount of tariff payment on EU export to Japan. Therefore, I readily uh, I really expect the negotiation to progress toward a greater trade liberation. And a little bit about employment policy. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, regarding labor policy, the House of Representatives passed the revised Worker Dispatching Act on the 19th this month. We appreciate this as a significant step forward. The proposed division of the Labor Standard Act featuring the introduction of a category of highly specialized professional workers is before the diet. Now that the diet session has been significantly extended to September 27th, I do hope that the bill will pass during the current session. And also an enactment of these divisions will provide both workers and management with more choices, which is a very good thing. However, management must be pay attention to avoiding a situation where those who are cautious about the bills fear. Another question is a monetary dissolution system for wrongful or unfair dismissal. A panel of experts is uh, established before the end of this year. I'm watching this progress in a very positive way. Uh, finally, come to the energy policy and the environment. Uh, on the subject of this energy policy, let me start with number uh, nuclear power. In July 2011, soon after the great East Japan earthquake, Keidai Doyuka issued a policy proposal that called for reducing dependence on nuclear power. This was followed in March this year by in-depth recommendations featuring three specific proposals. One is the first uh, restart and operate reactors once safety is confirmed. Second, reduce dependence on nuclear power to a certain level over the medium to long term by decommissioning absolute reactors and substituting nuclear power with renewable energy and energy conservation. Thirdly, it is like unlikely that renewable energy can meet more than 30% of energy needs by 2030, even if the pace of introduction is maximized. Therefore, to achieve about 50% in zero emission power generation, nuclear power will have to continue supplying at least 20% of Japan's power needs. These outline the basic thinking of Kedai Do Yukai on this subject. This is a, a drawing of, of what we are now thinking. Compared to 2010, before the earthquake, uh, we proposed to uh, reduce dependence on nuclear power to a certain level and dramatically increase renewable energy while reducing the percentage of coal or uh, gas fired. Our proposal is pretty much close to, to the government proposal. Uh, we, uh, our proposal was uh, just announced in the end of uh, March and the government after just uh, one month uh, later, nearly very similar uh, proposal has come from the government. Uh, finally, uh, environment policy. Uh, the G7 summit adopted a leader's declaration that introduced a new long-term goal for reducing global greenhouse gas emission by the upper end of 40 to 70 percent by 2050 compared to 2010 levels. The Japan government 
propose reduce greenhouse gas emission for 26% by 2030, based on amounts of 2013. This is a very aggressive target, I think. We request the government to establish an effective international framework with all major emitting countries at COP21 in Paris in December. In order to keep the rise in the average global temperature within two degrees centigrade, centigrade over the super long run, business have to pay a central role in implement innovation. We are asking the government to support R&D for innovation and to promote existing effective technologies, including highly efficient solar generation, storage batteries, LED lighting, insulator materials, and uh, very lightweight materials. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I forgot, just one housekeeping note, if you have your cell phone, if you could just please put it on a manner mode or turn it off. And anyway, so we'd like to go to questions from the uh, working press. Um, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please state your name and your affiliation, and uh, no uh, speeches. Martin Kölling with the German Financial Daily Handelsblatt. Uh, basically, two questions I would like to ask. One is about the situation in Europe. Everybody is now scratching their heads, uh, what this might uh, mean for the future. I would like to understand the position of the Japanese companies, of, of yourself, uh, what your concerns are regarding the situation in uh, Greece, possible Brexit, and what you fear could be the worst outcome for Japanese companies. This would be my first question. The second question is, you mentioned it a little bit in your speech, um, the new growth and fiscal consolidation plan of Prime Minister Abe. Um, I would like to understand your position on uh, your evaluation of the um, progress of Prime Minister Abe on two fronts. One is um, fiscal reconsolidation. Uh, because in that regard, Prime Minister Abe seems to hesitate um, to step on, uh, to start saving. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, I would like to understand whether you think that this really will lead to a fiscal consolidation this, uh, and can re basically reach the goal of um, turning into a, the deficit into a positive balance by 2020. The second point is um, then, of course, uh, the um, structural reforms, the so-called structural reforms. Uh, what, are the, what reforms do you think have been implemented already? How, suc how successful uh, have they been implemented? And what is still lacking in your point of view? Hi. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, in regard to your first question about Greece, um, as you see, um, there have been some effects uh, on the stock markets. In fact, before I came here, I was watching uh, how stock market prices, and they have fallen to the tune of about 500 or 550 yen or so. Uh, and so, it's obvious that there is some uh, impact about what is happening uh, regarding what is happening in, in Greece. As you know, however, next month, uh, on uh, the 5th, there will be a national referendum uh, held in Greece. And of course, everyone will be watching closely to see what the results will be. There are two possible outcomes. One is that uh, they will accept very, very uh, severe, harsh uh, austerity uh, measures, uh, conditions, and stay uh, as part of the EU, or they will uh, base or as part of the uh, euro, uh, or they will uh, decide to go off on their own. But in any event, uh, when we talk about the impact of uh, what Greece does, I think the Greek economy, and I do not mean to be uh, disrespectful, however, in the world economy, uh, plays a very small part. It is not such a huge um, economy. Uh, but having said this, however, as I mentioned earlier,
earlier, stock prices even in Japan are, are beginning to fall, and the world uh, markets, economic markets, financial markets, are very sensitive to any changes that happen uh, with Greece. Having said all of this, however, I think within a month or two, regardless of what the outcome of that national referendum might be, I think uh, markets will settle down. And if you're asking about uh, what the impact might be on Japanese companies or the Japanese economy, I think that over time uh, the impact will be uh, fairly small. Of course, uh, there are some companies, some organizations that deal directly with um, Greece, and they may have uh, some uh, difficult situations. But putting those uh, a few companies aside, I think in general the um, impact will be fairly small, in part because other countries in uh, Europe, such as Italy and Spain, are seeing an upturn in their economies. Uh, therefore, I do not think the overall impact will be very severe. In regard to your second question, um, certainly uh, Mr. Uh, Abe has been in power for about two and a half years from the end of 2012, and uh, he has taken a very, very different stance from the previous um, administration, which was led by the DPJ, the Democratic Party. I uh, took a very strong policy of not working with uh, bureaucrats. They wanted to go on their own. However, uh, the Abe administration has taken a very different tack, and they have not only cooperated with bureaucrats, but they have, in fact, cooperated with the many, many people in the private sector, academics, experts. Uh, they have created many different councils councils, and uh, of course, uh, one could be cynical and say that some of these councils of experts uh, are basically ways to um, give uh, a brand or a seal of approval to policies that the bureaucrats have thought up. But even if that is so, uh, I think everyone will agree that what Mr. Abe has done uh, it has been very, very well done. Uh, even if it is a performance, it has been a performance that has been very well done. Uh, next, uh, before we get into fiscal consolidation, uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, some of the experiences that I have uh, had with the uh, Abe administration. Um, in fact, uh, I'd just like to talk about his past two and a half years as head of the administration. On January 7, 2013, uh, I was uh, asked to become part of the CFB, the uh, Council on Economic and Fiscal uh, Policy, and I served uh, on this uh, council for about a year and nine months, uh, and uh, during that time, uh, there was uh, the uh, what is called the big-boned policy, uh, the uh, policy by the government uh, to basically stimulate uh, the economy. Um, also, uh, separately from that, uh, as of uh, September of 2014, uh, September of last year, I have become a member of the Industrial Competitiveness Council. Uh, and uh, as a result of my being a part of these two important uh, councils uh, that are attached to the government, I think I've been able to see what Mr. Abe has been trying to do and some of the results that he has been able to achieve uh, uh, very much up close. And uh, I would like to basically um, bring your uh, mind memories back to when uh, he first took the reins of power uh, at the time uh, the uh, Council on Econ Economic and Fiscal Policy was something that had uh, not been used at all by the uh, DPJ administration. And the first thing he did was revive uh, this council. Uh, and uh, as soon as he re regained power uh, in March uh, of the following year, uh, he basically tried to uh, revive the TPP negotiations. And uh, this is something that for uh, during the administration of the uh, DPJ, people thought it would be impossible to move forward with. But as you can see, Mr. Abe has made a tremendous progress in moving uh, this forward. And then in uh, April, uh, the following month, he appointed um, someone uh, very uh, spectacular, Mr. Kuroda, to be the governor of the Bank of Japan. Uh, and as a result, uh, he has been able to implement a quantitative monetary easing to the tune of about 80 trillion yen uh, plus. And, uh, and for me, uh, to be very honest, at that time, I thought uh, quantitative easing would not really be much of an answer because, after all, there had been some kind of um, easing uh, policies that had been uh, implemented even under the uh, tenure of the previous governor of the Bank of Japan. But uh, I see that uh, Mr. Kuroda's uh, efforts have been very, very successful. You've seen the uh, exchange rate uh, change from 100 yen to the dollar to 120 yen to the dollar. And that currency uh, rate shift has been a tremendous uh, revitalizing force for the Japanese economy. In addition to this, Mr. Abe pushed forth a supplementary budget of 5 trillion yen, which also helped revive the economy. Having said about all of this, however, you can see, however, when we look at um, individual uh, different companies, we see that CAPEX, uh, the investment in new infrastructure, uh, capacity has not risen uh, that much uh, yet. And that is because although uh, the results for the economy have been very positive over the past six months or so, uh, that's not enough for a company to justify making huge investments in the future. They have to be able to predict what the economy will be like five years into the future, ten years into the future. I wouldn't say they have to know what it's going to be a hundred years into the future, but at least five, ten years into the future. They must have some assurance that the economy will keep uh, growing. Uh, having said this, however, last year um, you asked about structural reform. 
Um, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, in January, I became a member of the Council of Economic and Fiscal uh, Policy, and we did a talk about uh, structural reform. We were still in the process, uh, the uh, era of version one, Japan version one, and at that time, it was said that this council, although it had been reactivated, was still very quiet and wasn't very accomplishing very, very much. However, in January, we had a meeting on January 21st, and we took up uh, very seriously the issue of uh, raising corporate taxes. And uh, this uh, great, uh, uh, gained great attention, and the following day, January 22nd, uh, we had another follow-up meeting, again, discussing corporate taxes, and I think this was the highlight of the activity of this council in that, um, of course, we faced tremendous opposition from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, however, Prime Minister Abe was very much uh, forward, looking forward to um, lowering the uh, corporate tax. Uh, eventually, we would like to see it go down to the, something in the 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, we don't expect it to go down as low as Singapore, which is 10 percent, but at least in the realm of uh, what we see in uh, China and uh, uh, excuse me, South Korea, which is about 25 percent. But um, in any event, uh, we see that corporate taxes uh, were uh, able to be decreased. And it's a funny paradox. Uh, you, th you would think that if you uh, lowered uh, corporate uh, taxes, then the uh, corporate uh, tax revenues for the government would decrease. But the actual result has been an increase in the corporate tax revenue to the tune of about 1 trillion yen. So what I'm saying is that if Prime Minister Abe continues uh, with his successful efforts to push the TPP forward, if he continues with his uh, attempts uh, to further uh, lower the corporate tax rate, then I think think in addition to the first two arrows, you know, monetary easing and fiscal stimulation, we will see m even more positive results. Yes. You also asked about structural reform, but uh, you see what has happened with uh, Prime Minister Abe and uh, the uh, Japan Agricultural Association, JA. Uh, this uh, area was considered to be one of the bedrock regulations uh, area uh, that were uh, very, very difficult to change. And although the legal um, uh, changes have not yet been put into uh, new laws, etc., still the fundamental reforms have already uh, taken place, and uh, he's made great progress in this area. Also, if we look at the medical field, we look at nursing care, we see, for example, that um, as uh, uh, evidenced by Okoyama University, uh, there are, is more and more progress on having uh, nonprofit organizations uh, become involved in this field. There's also another field in medical care called the gray zone area, which has to do with, for example, allowing uh, private individuals to, or other, or other individuals uh, who are not licensed doctors and nurses to take blood samples uh, to do uh, simple tests. Uh, in other words, he has been able to change uh, much of the regulations uh, in this area in very specific ways as well. Also, uh, the my number uh, uh, policy, uh, which includes also um, tax uh, collections uh, and also other uh, areas of uh, medical uh, care. We are seeing that uh, an area when, in which Japan was very much behind the rest of the world in terms, in terms of using more and more uh, IT or um, uh, technology. Uh, he is taking very, very positive um, steps to try to uh, allow Japan to catch up. Also, um, if I were to give you some specific examples, one of our subsidiaries, which is called Tanabe Mitsubishi Pharmaceuticals, uh, they are, are, are looking at uh, generic um, uh, medicines. Uh, and uh, two or three years ago, uh, the, there were only about 30% uh, of generic uh, medications that were uh, in uh, Japan. However, uh, now the figures are going up to about 40%. However, uh, that is still a very, very low number in comparison to the United States, where about 90% of the medications, uh, the, the medicines available are generics, and in uh, Europe, the numbers uh, go from 70 to about 80%. Uh, the generics, uh, introducing more generics uh, into uh, Japan is being seriously discussed and debated within uh, the uh, government. We're hoping that eventually by 2018, or at the latest by 2020, we will be able to in increase the percentage of generics uh, being used in Japan from uh, the current 40% to about 80%. Uh, these are the kinds of regulatory reforms that Mr. Uh, Abe is very much uh, promoting. This is something that is uh, very positive, not only for pharmaceutical companies, but for uh, the uh, the country uh, in, in general. Uh, by having uh, this uh, tremendous change, uh, uh, you will be able to have uh, much uh, more uh, money is freed up for uh, companies to invest uh, in new uh, innovative uh, medications. As you know, uh, generics have a positive and a negative effect. One is that it makes uh, medications cheaper for the general population, but also uh, it means that companies which had patents, see their patents run out, and all of these are very um, um, uh, profitable patents, uh, patented medications uh, now no longer produce money. Uh, this is something, therefore, th uh, that uh, companies are, are fee fee uh, facing a tremendous um, 
uh, difficulties, and this is a situation that needs to be resolved because of corporate governance issues, because I, as I said, myself, I'm involved in a pharmaceutical company because it's one of our subsidiaries. I can't speak up too much about this. Still, I am very, very um, pleased with the fact that Mr. Uh, Abe is moving forward with this kind of regulatory reform as well. So in regard to my views as to whether uh, Mr. Abe will be successful in achieving fiscal consolidation, in other words, producing a surplus uh, in the primary balance in 2020, um, as I referred to uh, uh, in my slide on page 13, uh, the uh, original goal was 2020. However, when we look at the economic growth rate uh, predictions, uh, standard predictions would be that you would have a nominal growth rate of 2%, a real growth rate of 1%. Uh, that would still mean that by 2020, we would have a 16.4 trillion yen deficit in the primary balance. Uh, if we were to be more optimistic and predict a nominal growth rate of 3% and a real growth rate of 2%, we would still be producing a deficit of 9.6 trillion yen. So um, the fundamental uh, uh, policy of the government at present is that it is a hoping uh, for the optimistic view to be realized, in other words, a nominal growth rate of 3% and a real growth rate of uh, 2%. And in addition to this, there's another concept called tax elasticity. Uh, and uh, this is predicted to be uh, 1.0. 1.0%, uh, that's the um, Minister of Finance's uh, 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 theoretical figure, and whereas the Council of Economic and Fiscal Policy is thinking more flexibly by 1.2, 1.3. Um, but in any event, let's, going back again, uh, we have this positive growth rate of 3.3% uh, um, nominal and 2% real, and on top of that, we have this tax elasticity, as which means that uh, the tax revenues uh, will uh, go up uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, we would have, uh, according to the positive growth scenario, a 9.6 trillion yen uh, deficit. But with this tax elasticity uh, concept uh, coming into play, that would account for an increase of tax revenues by about 4 trillion yen. So the difference that remains is that 5.5 trillion yen, 5.6 trillion yen is still the deficit that would remain in the primary balance in 2020. How to deal with that? This is where um, uh, the administration will have to make. Uh, specific decisions about how much and where to cut Social Security um, benefits. Um, of course, uh, probably after tomorrow, there will be more specific announcements from uh, various uh, parties, and we'll be able to see uh, the numbers uh, more clearly. But uh, what we are hearing is that the LDP uh, has made a decision, or, or is, is more or less formalizing a decision, uh, trying to hold down security benefits, Social Security um, expenditures, to about 500 billion yen uh, per year. Uh, that means from uh, this year to 2018, that would be three years, so it's a 1.5 trillion yen uh, savings. And if that can be achieved, I think eventually we will be able to somehow reach uh, this uh, uh, final uh, 2020 target. Uh, in other words, um, the only specific uh, target, uh, midterm target, that has actually been elucidated uh, uh, by the government is 2018, 1% of GDP. Uh, so again, uh, I go back to this um, LDP idea that if they can hold down Social Security expenditures uh, to about 500, trillion, 500 billion yen per year, uh, then I believe that somehow it will be possible uh, by 2020 to achieve um, at least a, a zero deficit before the primary balance by 2020. Sorry to follow up on that um, after going through um, all, all the fiscal reform issues, but um, one of the assumption is, assumptions is that you would have a 2% uh, real growth. And you said that was actually, I guess, a very, looks very optimistic. Um, so, I mean, how do you evaluate that 2% that target? So uh, if we look at the um, slides that I uh, uh, presented earlier, you see that uh, we did conduct these quarterly surveys of our members. Uh, the Doyukai uh, conducted a, sur a quarterly survey of its members. And according to the latest results of out of our members, the majority felt that uh, the GDP growth rate uh, would be 1.5 to 2 percent. Uh, and that's for, excuse me, the, uh, the, uh, the real uh, growth rate. And if we are able to sustain uh, this level of, um, of, of, of optimism, then I think that a 2 percent uh, gr real growth rate and a nominal growth rate of 3% certainly is not impossible uh, to imagine. Having said this, however, as I mentioned, in uh, 2015, we saw some special um, case, uh, special circumstances. Uh, the N uh, rate uh, went up, excuse me, from 80 yen to the dollar to 120 yen to the dollar. Um, I'm sorry, the yen fell uh, that much, which, of course, was a huge uh, stimulating um, uh, factor for the revitalizing uh, the Japanese economy. But the big question remains, is this uh, revitalization, uh, this, uh, this very um, 
great energetic uh, aspect of the uh, ec Japanese economy, something that is sustainable. Is that 2% uh, figure sustainable? That uh, is a question, and that's why I refer to this prediction as being a rather optimistic one. No. Uh, as you know, Japan has been blessed with what we call the three benefits or triple um, um, positive um, uh, factors. One is, as I mentioned, the currency rate. Uh, secondly, is that interest rates are incredibly low. Uh, third is that uh, crude oil prices have fallen tremendously. Uh, it used to be 100 uh, to 110 dollars per barrel, and now we're seeing uh, levels of about 40 to 60 dollars per barrel. Uh, having said this, however, um, is this again sustainable? Uh, the cur cur uh, currency rates uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, they're because of different things uh, that are occurring in world events. Uh, there may be a tend toward uh, the rise uh, in the value of the yen. Uh, of course, having said this, however, uh, U.S. interest rates uh, may uh, start to uh, rise. I got on this, like a big no. uh, It's going to go right, rise. Good uh, by the end of the year and uh, later in the year. And as a result, um, we might see rates of uh, currency exchange rates of maybe 125 yen to the dollar. But generally, um, I think uh, they're going to basically remain flat. Um, and I don't think that uh, crude oil prices are going to move uh, or change that much more uh, in the future. What I'm saying is that uh, we've been blessed by these triple uh, factors, uh, very positive factors, but we don't see uh, tremendous changes uh, uh, along those lines in the future, at least immediately on the horizon. So whether this growth is going to be sustainable or not, uh, I cannot really talk with confidence about when I look five years into the future. Sorry, and then just to follow up, I mean, you had a very, I guess, positive overall evaluation of uh, Abe's uh, macroeconomic policies. Um, but w what about uh, areas that you think need to be done that haven't been tackled or may not be tackled because of uh, resistance from, I guess, special interests uh, and also like the Zoku and the LDP? Um, I think there are several um, areas in which uh, he does have uh, some work uh, left uh, for him to try to resolve. Uh, one is that we are dealing in an age where cybersecurity is a very, very critical and uh, a concern. Uh, is a cyber the, is because cybersecurity is a very, very pressing issue for many people, um, although he has plans to um, uh, bring IT uh, into uh, the uh, Japanese society and have, and go forward with this my number uh, idea. How far will he be able to actually proceed? Um, uh, th that is one question mark that I have uh, for him. Uh, one is that you referred to forces of resistance or private uh, interest groups, but uh, special interest groups. But I think um, one more pressing issue is uh, this idea of revitalizing regional areas. In other words, how to sort of change the mindset. Uh, many people are sort of satisfied with just how things uh, uh, are, but uh, I think some serious fundamental issues about reorganizing, uh, for example, uh, structures and organizations, institutions within uh, regional areas is something that needs to be uh, tackled. And also, uh, the third area that I think uh, remains a problem is uh, how to deal with um, uh, doctors, uh, not doctors who work for major hospitals, but uh, private doctors who have their own private practices, uh, how they might uh, resist uh, some of the uh, regulatory reforms in the medical sector that Mr. Abe wants to proceed forward with. <laughs> Anthony Rowley, Singapore Business Times. Um, how far do you think the shift of Japanese production offshore has impacted the fiscal position in recent years? Um, what has been the net effect? Obviously, some tax is lost, some continues to come back onshore, but what is your overall assessment of the impact of the offshoring of Japanese production? So, um, if I start talking about this uh, from both a microeconomic and a macroeconomic point of view, um, I, uh, it's very, very difficult to answer, uh, uh, but I'd like to touch upon uh, various uh, issues in, in both uh, areas, both macroeconomics and a microeconomics point of view. Um, I think, first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, currency exchange rates, um, the fact that uh, you see the, um, the dollar uh, won uh, rate exchange rate 80 to s or 70 yen uh, to the dollar. Um, I would like to point out that uh, when we look at the Japanese uh, consumer electronics industry, they were extremely strong in the world from the period from about 2000 to 2005. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, companies in these uh, fields, such as Sharp, um, Panasonic, and Sony, um, justify uh, the uh, difficulties that they've had in their business because of the uh, currency exchange rate fluctuations. But um, I have long taken a stance that um, 
these are not simply excuses that they're making. Their troubles are truly based in great part on these currency range, um, exchange uh, fluctuations. When we consider a, a company such as Sharp, which was first in the world uh, promoting um, LCDs, liquid crystal displays, and they were so powerful and had great technology and had 70 or 80 percent market share in the world, and now you see that they are on the verge of collapse. Um, this is obviously and only due uh, uh, to the currency exchange fluctuations. And um, when we look at uh, Sony as a result of these currency uh, exchange uh, fluctuations and the, um, the high dollar uh, effects, uh, they have shifted a great deal of their production uh, facilities abroad. In the steel uh, producing sector, most of the uh, production has gone abroad. In the chemical sector in which I uh, uh, belong, uh, it used to be that uh, a few years ago, uh, about 20% to 30% of our sales were from abroad. Now the uh, standard industry figure is about 30 to 40%. Uh, if we look at the um, uh, the uh, mechanical equipment uh, machinery sector. Again, production facilities are about 80 or 90 percent shifted abroad. In the automobile sector, 60 to 70 percent abroad. When we look at all of these different industries and all of these um, huge uh, percentages of production uh, facilities being uh, taken abroad, we see that the biggest uh, factor for uh, this shift is because of the high dollar. Uh, so you mean uh, in that sense, uh, when we look at um, income uh, revenues, income, uh, some balance of, of payments. Uh, when we look at, for example, the dividends that come from abroad, um, and 90% of um, the dividends uh, are non-taxable. Uh, so what that means is that when we look at uh, the um, uh, balance of trade, uh, the the effects, uh, the, excuse me, we have a, um, excuse me, uh, a negative uh, balance of trade in terms of, um, of, of, of products, but the current of accounts, uh, current account surplus uh, is a surplus because, in, in other words, we're getting financial revenues from abroad. In other words, what that means is that uh, when we convert yen to dollars, uh, we're seeing a tremendous uh, benefit for uh, for Japan uh, because of the currency exchange rates. In other words, if it used to be that before the currency exchange rates uh, changed, uh, when, it, when it was uh, 80 yen to the dollar, uh, we would have, for example, 800 billion yen in revenues from abroad. That 800 billion yen in revenues is now um, uh, 1,000, excuse me. Excuse me, 8 billion yen in revenues from abroad is now 12 billion yen in revenues from abroad. So um, again, uh, uh, because of the uh, currency exchange uh, fluctuations, we're seeing uh, a profit, at least on the balance books, uh, excuse me, on the, on the books. Uh, but most of these uh, profits, however, are reinvested uh, into the facilities uh, abroad. And so when we look at the um, overall uh, uh, benefits for the Japanese government, uh, Japanese uh, coffers, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the trade um, uh, balance uh, is in the red for Japan. I mentioned earlier because of uh, different investments in held in, in, in different papers, uh, stocks, uh, and all the dividends. Uh, again, if we just look at the consolidated um, uh, accounts, then uh, Japanese, the, the uh, current account uh, for Japan and other nations, uh, Japan is producing a surplus. But again, these are just simply on, on the books. Uh, they're, they're for the consolidated um, accounts. And as a result, the fundamental um, positive benefits for the, uh, for the Japanese economy are not positive. There are no positive the effects. So um, if uh, the, uh, uh, the yen uh, continues to fall, uh, we are seeing that uh, there are different trends in different industries. For example, if we look at the chemical industry or we look at the uh, steel industry, um, the investments that must be made into infrastructure are on the order of 100 billion yen. And that's a huge investment and that, you know, you really can't um, take back and bring back uh, to Japan. However, uh, in other uh, areas such as, uh, that basically do um, uh, assembly work, um, you know, there, were, there are many, many components uh, to the final product, uh, such as the machinery industry and the automobile industry, we are beginning to see some uh, production uh, shift back, uh, come back to Japan, there is that kind of a trend uh, that we are seeing. But what I'm trying to get at overall is that uh, the way that the uh, governments look at uh, the balance of trade uh, or current accounts uh, or in the way that uh, companies look at their financial statements are very, very fundamentally different because governments only look uh, for uh, the results for a single year where, and uh, for single uh, industries or single areas, whereas uh, companies uh, don't really care where their uh, production facility might be, where retail sales might be, 
they look at the consolidated accounts. Uh, they don't care where things are actually located. So it's a different way of looking at the world and, the, and, and economies. <laughs> Erich Bonnert, freelance journalist from Germany. I would like to change the pace on the subject a little bit. Uh, you mentioned uh, breaking the corporate mindset as one of your the things on that you would like to see happen. Uh, what kind of mindset do you want to prevail over the current one? And is, is there anyone, any executive, any corporation that exemplifies that mindset in your, in your mind? I, I, do um, I think that uh, when we look at um, uh, any sector in Japan, uh, any industrial sector in Japan, I think there is a lot of wasted um, energy um, um, that we see because uh, small companies, many numerous companies are competing against each other and that kind of competition is really wasteful. It should be uh, more consolidated uh, and uh, Japanese companies should, I believe, uh, compete on the global stage. Uh, for example, even if we say, look at the automobile sector, which is, is considered to be fairly um, uh, consolidated, we still see maybe 10 large automobile companies. Uh, when we look at my own sector, the chemical industry, we have about 20,000 uh, small companies competing uh, fiercely against each other. And uh, we look at the big steel companies, they're still two or three. Uh, the uh, financial uh, sector has seen uh, much more ind industry consolidation, but still there seems to be this fundamental mindset, this tradition in Japan, uh, that uh, people like to uh, work on in small groups, in, on small things. Uh, for example, if we look at Japanese agriculture, instead of being very practical and pragmatic and having huge uh, tracts of farmland and being very, very efficient, uh, still people value uh, farmers who just uh, um, are uh, nurturing a special kind of rice just in a very small uh, field and people are very, very proud of that the unique uh, rice that is produced uh, in that very, very small uh, field. Uh, this, I guess, comes from this village mentality uh, that has long been uh, in uh, Japan. I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I think industry should um, uh, aim for double-digit um, ROE figures, uh, like 10% or more, yet a lot of industry uh, people, even uh, corporate executives, uh, are satisfied with less than that if they, they say, it's okay as long as we are still in the black. We don't have to have huge um, uh, ROE uh, figures. Uh, there's no reason that we all have to compete in the global markets as long as we can basically you know, manage to all be all survive and all be more or less happy, uh, then I think that's uh, fine enough. And this fundamental idea, uh, this way of thinking, is I think something that needs to be changed. Um, if we look at agricultural, I think we need to be able to con uh, consolidate um, agricultural land into huge uh, tracts of land and be more efficient with farming. Um, if we look at, for example, um, manufacturers of, of, of specific uh, components, um, pieces of equipment for, for our larger uh, pieces of equipment, um, uh, uh, making uh, small tools, etc. Now, I think that, and I know that this will, um, because uh, the, sta the the level of quality of that of uh, products that are produced by many of these small uh, companies are very, very high. I know that I will receive criticism for mentioning this, but I think they should also be uh, integrated into larger entities so that they can compete on the global stage. However, this kind of thinking you see not only among people in agriculture, not only among people in different industries, but also among politicians. I mentioned earlier about the problem of uh, regional revitalization. If you look at all of the politicians who work at different levels of uh, government uh, organizations, you see that they do not want to lose their jobs. Even if we talk about the Doshu Se, which is uh, trying to bring in the sort of state system, consolidating many prefectures into very large blocks, uh, regional blocks, um, many governors will stand up and say, I will lose my job. I don't want to lose my governorship. I'm against this. In other words, when we look at every sector, we still have many, many people, the majority of people still having a, this uh, a traditional mindset and very few examples of uh, of this kind of mindset I would like to see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up um, on the point uh, where manufacturing, some of it's coming back, and part of that is due to, I guess, the, the much weaker yen. Um, what role do, does um, electricity price play in, in that? I mean, there's been a lot of uh, consternation over the, the rise in the electricity prices. But to me, it, it, from what I understand, for the corporates, it's usually not that big of an issue unless you're, like, making aluminum. Uh, 
So um, it's very, very difficult to comment, uh, uh, or to, to respond to this uh, from a, a qualitative uh, point of view. Um, I can say, however, that uh, in regard to, uh, excuse me, from a, a quantitative point of view, uh, but uh, certainly in terms of um, the kilowatt hour price of electricity, it's about 18 yen uh, at present, and uh, the numbers are actually rising. This is three times uh, the price of the United States, 2.5 times uh, the price in, in South Korea. So uh, again, even though um, crude oil prices have fallen and so drastically, we have not seen a corresponding a huge uh, a decrease in the price of electricity. And it really depends on uh, what industry you're in, how much you depend on uh, electricity. Uh, if uh, it, you are in an industry that does not depend so much on uh, electricity, then you again, you will be seeing these trends where these uh, companies move their production facilities back to Japan. Now, however, uh, for example, uh, in the steel industry or maybe the petrochemical industry where, uh, again, electricity uh, costs are a very, very um, prominent um, factor, then I think uh, probably in the, the foreseeable future, you will not see a huge move, shift uh, of those production facilities abroad and moving back uh, to uh, Japan. Of course, we know that there is one positive factor in terms of electricity prices on the horizon, uh, which is that uh, the nuclear power plants uh, are going to be uh, in part restarted. Uh, and of course, we know, however, that uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to pr pr produce a calculation as to um, what electricity prices uh, should be uh, once nuclear power plants start again, uh, because the previous way of calculating uh, electricity produced by nuclear power plants are obviously no longer holds. We have to think about uh, the costs of um, uh, dealing with uh, nuclear waste. We have to think about the plutonium um, recycling um, costs. All of these have to come into play. But still, even though we do not know the final calculations uh, when the re uh, nuclear power plants restart, at least psychologically, the fact that uh, nuclear power plants restarting might uh, produce uh, a lower uh, electricity price is a positive aspect for the Japanese economy. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. We've actually, seems like we've covered uh, an enormous amount of uh, areas. Um, and uh, thank you again, uh, Takamatsu-san, for some very long um, uh, interpretation. Anyway, as is our uh, usual custom, uh, we would like to give um, our, our guest speaker today an honorary membership uh, to the club. And uh, hopefully uh, we will see you in the club at some point again. And maybe we can get an update in another uh, year or so in terms of how uh, you know, abenomics is, is going. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.